Okay, well hello everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, wrap up this webinar series. And um, uh, my name is Paul Fisher. I work at University of Florida um, in Extension. And uh, this is the last of our nine webinars that we've had. We've covered a number of different uh, topics, and I'll just run through those very quickly. Uh, Tom Yeager discussed aspects of water conservation and best management practices, which is a very uh, helpful system here for growers in Florida, and covered some tips in terms of uh, aspects such as uniform distribution of water um, and avoiding runoff. We then went into some presentations about um, plant pathology, which really underlies um, a lot of what we're doing this water treatment um, uh, work for uh, in terms of controlling the possibility of, of spreading pathogens through our irrigation system. We had presentations from uh, Gary Chastagner and Jennifer Park. I then talked a little bit about monitoring uh, water quality in terms of the chemical aspects, physical, uh, biological water quality, and also measuring sanitizing agents. Uh, filtration, which is something I'm going to touch on today, was um, covered in a very nice presentation there by um, Al Zilster from Dram Water. And uh, I won't have time today to go into it in as much depth, so I'd encourage you to go uh, and, and check out that presentation. Warren Copes talked about the use of sanitizers for cleaning surfaces, um, so products such as the activated peroxygens or quaternary ammonium chloride products, chlorine, in terms of cleaning tools, cleaning benches, and so on. Ken Wagner uh, focused on pond management or catchment basins. And I think one of the key things here is that um, if you're using any surface water or captured water, you're going to be dealing with a, um, a water source that is very high in microbial load and organic load. And before even that water enters into uh, the greenhouse or nursery system, there are some things that can be done to manage algae and other issues in the pond. Walter uh, Wohanka last week um, did a very nice presentation going through individual technologies. And so I'm not going to spend as much time discussing each technology one at a time because Walter did such a nice job on that. And I'll focus more in terms of pulling those different technologies together into um, an overall uh, control system. Okay, well let's just um, take an example of why this topic matters. This is research work that was done by um, a student, PhD student in my group, Dustin Metter. And what Dustin did was he went into um, about 24 different nurseries and greenhouses around the United States and sampled the water quality at different points. One aspect of what he was sampling was this count of aerobic bacteria in colony forming units per milliliter. And this is a count not really of pathogens, but it's an indicator of microbial load, how many organisms, microorganisms, are, are living in the water. You sample at different points in the irrigation system, at the source, whether that was a municipal supply or well, furthest outlet away from the source, uh, concrete lined and covered tanks, uh, such as in sub-irrigation systems, even flow benches and floors inside greenhouses, and catchment basins or ponds. And the recommended level for these uh, aerobic bacteria in irrigation water for uh, use in drip irrigation systems is around 10,000 colony forming units per milliliter or less. And as you can see, as we um, go through the different points in the irrigation system, we have very high microbial load levels in our tank, ebb and flow, and pond. That indicates the need for treatment. And also, the difference between the source and the furthest outlet, what that is, is it's the uh, indication of biofilm development inside the irrigation line. So you can see that very often we're dealing with situations where we have high microbial load in irrigation systems. Well, another thing that Dustin did was he took samples through the different irrigation system before and after treatment. So here we have six different greenhouses and nurseries. These were the different types of chlorination in this case that we're using as examples. And chlorine can be provided as a gas, um, as a liquid, as sodium hypochlorite, or as tablets, as calcium hypochlorite. 
these were the water sources, whether it's a municipal supply, pond water, well water. And here is a sample that Dustin took of this aerobic, aerobic bacteria count before the water passed through the treatment injection. You can see that here where we've got a municipal supply, we had very good quality water coming in. And also in this location, the well water was fairly variable. You can see this is actually a very high count for well water, and occasionally you get um, poor quality well water in terms of biological quality, which indicates contamination, and this was, this was a, um, a shallow well um, in, in southern Florida. And here where we've got pond water, you see there's a very high microbial load, as we've seen in the previous slide. Now these are the numbers after treatment with the chlorine. And you can see that most of these numbers are very low, either because they started low or because the treatment system indicated rapid um, kill of those microorganisms. But there's one example here where we have a nursery where we had high levels before treatment and also unacceptably high levels after treatment in terms of being over 10,000 colony forming units per milliliter. What this would indicate is, let's say we had a pathogen in that pond. Um, it's unlikely that we're going to get very good control um, after treatment if we're not able to reduce this total microbial load count. It's an indicator, kind of a, a measurement. So in those systems that we evaluated, they included chlorine, copper, ozone, activated peroxygens, and a membrane filtration with reverse osmosis. And in seven of the 18 systems that had a treatment um, system in place, they had more than the 10,000 colony forming units of bacteria per milliliter after the treatment. So that means that you could say those systems were not delivering water with a high biological quality and they'd be vulnerable for contamination with a pathogen. So really we, we want to step back a little bit and think, think, why are some of these water treatment systems failing? And what can we learn from? Well, probably the best starting point is looking at municipal drinking water supplies. They have some incoming water. They have a series of filtration processes and chemical treatment. And then they have a final product uh, that's delivered through the piping to the household. And there are some features about this process that we can apply to horticultural irrigation water. One of them is that the final product has well-defined standards in terms of coliform units and um, pathogen presence, contaminants such as inorganic and organic molecules. There's also a principle in water treatment that's called a multi-barrier approach. We don't rely on just one technology to um, get complete sanitation of our water. So we have backup systems. We have some redundancy in there to ensure that we've got good risk management, that if there was some, in this case, um, human pathogens that came in the incoming water, we would have more than one system in place, more than one technology in place to control it. Another aspect of water treatment design is that based on the flows and the incoming water quality, we design uh, the capacity of the system to consistently produce water of a, an acceptable quality at the end. So when we can contrast that into um, horticultural irrigation, often we really don't pay that much attention to this initial water quality. We just kind of pull out an off-the-shelf type system, and we often don't also do an adequate job of monitoring whether our systems um, actually working in terms of delivering the work quality we want. And with regular testing of this final water quality in a municipal water supply system, uh, they are checking uh, that their quality, they're doing a quality control process, standard operating procedure, to make sure that they're consistently meeting the regulatory goals in terms of uh, safe drinking water. And that feeds back into a maintenance program. So it's not just install it and forget it. There's a, there's a regular testing process and maintenance uh, schedule in place. 
So let's take that one example of a grower where the chlorine system wasn't working. In most cases, it did seem to be chlorine did seem to be providing adequate treatment. But what was happening in that one location? Well, there was not a, a multiple barrier approach. There was just one barrier. It was chlorination, um, in this case with tablets, but could have been with a, a different treat, treatment technology. That was all that was in place. We had only one technology. There was a high organic load from the sediment in the Sunline pond and also a high microbial load. And that uh, incoming water before chlorination was not filtered. So that water had a very high demand and it's unlikely that the chlorine would be able to control any target organisms such as pathogens because of all of the background noise and demand from the sediment and other microbes. There also wasn't any pH control, uh, which is very common in nursery um, water treatment with chlorine. But chlorine, for anyone who has a swimming pool or um, a spa pool, knows that pH management is very important. That if that pH is too high, then the chlorine is in a, a weak sanitizing form. So really, pH management in terms of acid injection and certainly pH monitoring go hand in hand with chlorination. And the grower was doing a good job of checking um, chlorine levels delivered um, to the outlet here going out to the crop, as well as what was being injected. But there wasn't um, a regular testing of some other aspects of water quality, such as this bacteria counts or sending samples off to, um, to a plant pathology lab for testing. 